And greetings to you. Joe Rubenstein here, producer and host of Real Time 1960s. I want to thank you very much for joining me today for episode 11 of this Portal into the Past, where I document and reflect on the 60s in real time with both podcasts and our daily timeline of what happened exactly 60 years ago. And that timeline, along with all our podcasts, social media links, contact info, all that is there for you on our newly revamped website, realtime1960s.com. Last time, I concluded my two-part look at the Bay of Pigs invasion, but today we turn our attention to what I believe is the best American film of 1961, The Hustler, released 60 years ago this month. Based on the novel The Hustler by Walter Tevis, directed by veteran Robert Rawson, who also adapted the screenplay, the film boasts a terrific cast with great chemistry, despite the very different uh, personalities and backgrounds of the actors. Uh, Paul Newman as the cocky, up-and-coming pool hustler Eddie Felsen, Piper Laurie as his troubled uh, love interest Sarah Packard, George C. Scott as Burt Gordon, the ruthless uh, gambler and financier, And finally, Jackie Gleason as Minnesota Fats, the champion that Eddie seeks to dethrone. And contrary to the reviews of the day, which portrayed this film as a kind of expose of the shadowy world of the pool hustler, it's much more than that. It's really about uh, what it means to be a human being. And while the hustler certainly entertains, uh, there's real pain in the film, which accumulates almost without our realizing it. And much of its power lies in the fact that the journey on which it takes us uh, seems entirely plausible. Uh, So my personal review of The Hustler, right now. Now, to give Walter Tevis his due, much of the film's dialogue is drawn directly from the book. But Rawson made significant changes in the second half of the story, uh, which helped animate Uh, buried themes that are implied in the novel but not fully realized. Rawson, who was a product of the Lower East Side, uh, had started his career in the 30s as a screenwriter for Warner Brothers, uh, which had that incredible uh, roster of stars at that time. Cagney, Bogart, uh, Edward G. Robinson, and then John Garfield, uh, with whom uh, Rawson had a close association, very similar backgrounds. And Garfield, in 1947, uh, starred in Rawson's first a directorial success, a boxing film called Body and Soul, about the struggle uh, between a cold, crooked gambler on the one hand and a nurturing woman on the other, uh, for the soul of the protagonist, played by uh, Garfield. And this is precisely the triangle that develops in the film version of The Hustler. Uh, Rawson greatly expanded the Sarah Packard character, creating one of the more multidimensional uh, female film characters of the early 60s. And Rawson, who had directed the very worthwhile Academy Award-winning film All the King's Men in 1949, which, like Body and Soul and like The Hustler, uh, deals with the issue of personal corruption, uh, Rawson had seen his career suffer in the early 50s over his uh, former membership in the Communist Party, which he joined in 1937 and left about uh, 10 years later. He was called before the House uh, Un-American Activities Committee in 1951 and took uh, what was then called the Augmented Fifth, stating accurately uh, that he was not a member of the party, but refusing to answer the question of whether he'd ever been a member, which did not uh, satisfy the committee. So after two more years on the blacklist, during which the State Department refused to renew his passport so he couldn't work abroad, he testified again in 1953, and this time, uh, as his colleague uh, Ilya Kazan had done the previous year, admitted his former membership and identified a number of people in the industry as communists or former communists. Since this is not a real-time 1950s, I'm not going to get into a discussion of that uh, historical episode, but Rawson was permitted to work again after this uh, second uh, testimony and the commercial success of what was really a work for hire, a film he didn't write uh, but directed for 20th Century Fox in 1957 called Island in the Sun, uh, which was uh, described accurately by one of its stars, Harry Belafonte, as a terrible picture based on a terrible uh, best-selling book 
But the theme of interracial romance, uh, even though it's presented in the mildest possible way, fueled controversy and then uh, ticket sales. It was the sixth uh, highest grossing film that year. And through that success, Rawson was able to start rebuilding his status as a power player. And after buying the rights to The Hustler, uh, Rawson turned uh, to Fox once again for financing and distribution. Although uh, once Paul Newman signed on, that wasn't a tough sell. By 61, uh, Newman was a proven moneymaker. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof uh, had been MGM's most profitable release in 1958. And then Exodus uh, was the third uh, highest grossing film of 1960. But the subject matter of The Hustler was concerning uh, to the executives at Fox. First of all, they thought the pool room hustle uh, would have limited appeal to a broad audience, especially uh, the female demographic. They also thought that the title, The Hustler, uh, might make people think it was about a prostitute. Uh, So they changed it uh, to Sin of Angels. Thankfully, uh, that was reversed. But Rawson uh, had learned a trick or two over the years uh, dealing with these people and was a bit of a hustler himself. So just as a pool hustler will defraud uh, potential opponents by portraying himself as less gifted than he is, Rawson portrayed this film to the executives as being far more conventional than it was to gain their approval. He deliberately presented a simplified, really false synopsis uh, that bore little relation to the film that he wished uh, to make and did make. So according to this fake synopsis, uh, the film was about a young pool hustler who loses his head while playing the champ and thus loses the match. All right, so far so good. Then, he's taken on by a manager, Bert, uh, who teaches him how to win. He then plays the champ again and wins. End of story. So, no mention of the Sarah Packard uh, character, uh, who drives the central conflict. No mention of the fact uh, that the quote-unquote manager, uh, played by George C. Scott, is nothing short of demonic. In fact, uh, he's the antagonist in the film, and someone that Pauline Keel described as a personification of the power of money. Not dissimilar, actually, to the moguls uh, that Rawson was conning uh, with this uh, bogus synopsis. So Fox, uh, blissfully unaware of the film's uh, central darkness, uh, was pacified with what seemed to them uh, like a formula sports movie. So Rawson was able to keep them off his back. It also helped uh, that he shot the film entirely in New York. And the film, uh, to the surprise of the executives, uh, did really well. Uh, Five and a half million at the box office, great reviews, Uh, eight Oscar nominations, and uh, Jackie Gleason uh, made the cover of Time magazine, which was a really big deal back then. So before I get into the actual uh, synopsis of this film, uh, spoilers ahead. You know, I can't really talk about the film uh, without uh, talking about the film, right? So if you haven't seen it and want to watch it and come back, uh, you have my official blessing. If you don't, uh, rest assured uh, there's plenty that I won't reveal about the film, which I can report does hold up uh, to multiple viewings. So after an opening uh, pre-credit pool hustle scene in a suburban bar, which introduces us uh, to Eddie and his kind of uh, father figure manager, Charlie, uh, and then the credits uh, comes the first major segment of the film, which takes place entirely uh, in the old uh, Ames Billiard Academy, uh, which was located in the Claridge Hotel in Times Square, that hotel uh, demolished in 1972. Uh, So Eddie and Charlie enter this cathedral of pool uh, for their shot at the champ. And soon enough, we're launched into the marathon with Fats, as Eddie uh, loses at first and then starts to win big. Money man Bert Gordon is summoned by Fats, and after observing uh, Eddie's kind of juvenile trash-talking antics, Bert identifies an inner core of weakness, uh, which he then activates by loudly instructing Fats, stay with this kid, he's a loser. Uh, despite the fact that Eddie is now ahead $18,000. Charlie just wants to take the money and run, but Eddie uh, says the match isn't over until Fats says so. Uh, Then uh, comes a little set piece that likely is what earned uh, Jackie Gleason, his supporting actor, uh, nomination. They've been at this for 24 hours, but Fats, uh, having surveyed the field of battle and finding uh, conditions favorable, emerges from the washroom uh, fresh as a daisy, very deliberately uh, puts on his uh, tailored jacket, carnation still fresh in the lapel, uh, sprinkles some powder on his hands, uh, takes out a cigarette case, and says, uh, Fast Eddie, let's play some pool, as if uh, the previous 24 hours uh, have been uh, merely a preamble. 
So Eddie, after mocking uh, Fats' appearance, proceeds to get drunk and blow through all his money, uh, finally telling Fats, I got about $200 here. You can't run out on me. And Fats uh, just looks at him and says, you watch me. And Gleason's uh, delivery of that line is tremendous. There's, there's contempt, but also sadness. Uh, for the first time, uh, you get the sense that this too uh, is a tragic figure who knows uh, far more about Eddie than Eddie knows about himself as Gleason uh, slaps uh, the evening's take into Bert's hand and marches out the door. The next segment uh, presents Eddie as a kind of uh, transient. He walks out on Charlie and uh, parks his suitcase and pool cue in a locker at the Greyhound bus terminal that used to exist uh, alongside the old uh, Penn Station. Uh, Rawson constructed a cafe in that terminal uh, that was so convincing that travelers uh, would wander onto the set and wait to be served. But that cafe is where we first see uh, Sarah Packard sitting alone uh, pretending to wait for a bus. Uh, so after a half-hearted uh, pickup try uh, by Eddie fails, we dissolve to later that evening in the terminal bar, uh, where Eddie uh, stumbles across Sarah again, and we learn that she is a highly intelligent alcoholic and a part-time college student uh, leading a life of chronic uh, aimlessness. She's also partially lame due to a childhood bout with polio. And after a third uh, wordless uh, meeting with Sarah at the terminal, they leave together, uh, two lost souls. In the third segment, uh, the healthier uh, part of Sarah's uh, ego starts to emerge as she falls in love with Eddie. The trouble is that she wants it too much, and he isn't sure uh, if he wants it at all. So one day, Charlie shows up and asks Eddie uh, to go back on the road with him. But Charlie lets it slip uh, that he had held money in reserve uh, during the Fats match. And Eddie just explodes, uh, making the highly dubious claim that if he'd had that money, he could have come back to win. So things get progressively nastier until Eddie uh, finally tells Charlie, uh, lay down and die by yourself. Don't take me with you. And on that line, uh, there's a cut to Sarah as a single tear uh, rolls down her cheek, uh, perhaps crying as much for her own hopes uh, in this relationship uh, as for Charlie. So after a period of kind of uh, moral dissolution uh, for the couple of uh, isolation uh, booze and uh, sex as a kind of uh, emotional anesthesia, uh, Eddie storms out one day after an argument and comes across Bert again, uh, who with brutal uh, frankness elaborates on his earlier diagnosis of Eddie as a loser. Uh, not for lack of talent, uh, but for lack of character, or Bert's uh, version of character, namely killer instinct. Uh, even so, uh, Bert offers to stake Eddie for a rematch with Fats in exchange for 75% of the take which Eddie uh, angrily rejects and then proceeds directly uh, to the first of several circles of hell uh, presented in this film, a creepy pool hall off the west side docks, where he gets caught hustling by some uh, tough clientele and ends up uh, with a bad case of the broken thumbs, at which point uh, he crawls back to Sarah, who takes him in. Now, the struggle that I mentioned between Bert and Sarah for Eddie's soul is set up in segment four. Uh, with both hands in casts, uh, unable to play, uh, Eddie's convalescence uh, is deeply frustrating for him, but strengthens her. Uh, she stops drinking, uh, starts writing, and uh, falls ever more deeply in love. And in one of the best scenes in the film, a picnic scene, and the only extended sequence shot outdoors, Eddie asks her if she thinks he's a loser. Uh, Bert's designation has been eating away at him. So after hearing that uh, Bert is a gambler, uh, Sarah asks Eddie if he's a winner. Uh, Eddie says, uh, well, he owns things. And she says, uh, is that what makes a winner? And he says, well, what else does? Which is meant uh, rhetorically, but really that's the central question of the film. And Paul Newman uh, deserves uh, some credit for the existence of this scene, which is not in the book. When Newman first read this script in Paris, uh, where he was shooting a film, he knew how good it was. He later said, quote, The Hustler was one of those movies uh, when you wake up every day and could hardly wait to get to work because you knew it was so good that nobody was going to be able to louse it up. But Newman did ask Rawson to add a scene uh, that bolstered his interpretation, which I agree with, of the Eddie character as a kind of artist or master craftsman. Uh, Newman said, quote, I told Rawson he ought to somehow uh, liken what Eddie does to what anybody who's performing something sensational is doing. Could be a ball player, or it could be somebody who laid uh, 477 bricks in one day. 
So Rawson wrote this scene uh, where Eddie makes a speech and talks about the feeling he gets uh, when he's playing and everything is really clicking. After which, uh, Sarah says that he's not a loser and that she loves him, adding uh, correctly, some men never get to feel that way about anything. So here's a legitimate uh, crossroads moment. Uh, Bert has offered one uh, vision of life, uh, a hard vision uh, of life as a kind of bank statement, essentially. And here's another, a more human, more uh, inner directed. And unfortunately, it's one that Eddie uh, just does not know what to do with. Uh, so after the casts are removed, uh, he makes his deal with the devil, accepting Bert's harsh terms as they plan an out-of-town warm-up in Louisville against a kind of dissipated rich guy named Finley, uh, played by Murray Hamilton, who would later play uh, the dissipated Mr. Robinson uh, in The Graduate. So the night before the trip, Eddie takes uh, Sarah out to dinner in a fancy restaurant, where it dawns on her that this is goodbye, maybe for good. And after a very uh, raw exchange, uh, Sarah uh, finally convinces Eddie to take her with him, setting up the direct conflict with Bert and sealing her doom. Segment five unfolds uh, with the merciless momentum of a nightmare. On the train to Kentucky, Bert, uh, with the predatory instincts of a hawk, immediately uh, begins clawing at uh, Sarah's uh, self-esteem. Little uh, demeaning remarks, uh, subtle condescension. Uh, but the true uh, hostilities uh, commence at the hotel in Louisville. Eddie goes off with some friends, and Sarah, uh, who's alone with Bert for the first time, uh, makes so bold as to challenge his authority. And here uh, is where that controlled uh, savagery at which uh, George C. Scott was truly unsurpassed emerges. The body language as he stalks toward her and uh, using every inch of that tall frame uh, peers down and kind of bores in with that wonderfully uh, guttural raspy voice. It's like uh, coins uh, rattling around a rusty tin can. And seeing her wilt under this uh, verbal uh, rampage as he cruelly uh, puts her in her place, he backs off a little and adds, I'll make it up to you. And when she asks uh, in a trembling, uh, hollowed out voice, how? You know that not only is she done, but it dawns on you with horror that the moth to a flame uh, part of her makeup is actually attracted to Bert. And that attraction is underlined in a later scene as well. So Rawson is not interested in trotting out cliched uh, Hollywood characters here. Uh, Sarah isn't some uh, 1940s style uh, angel in distress. And the Bert character is not only ruthless. He's also uh, highly intelligent. He can be charming. He can be insightful. He makes a speech at one point uh, about the human tendency toward uh, self-pity, where I found myself nodding in agreement. So Rawson, to his credit, is really giving you people as they are, uh, namely flawed and complex. And I'm not making any comparisons here, but that's what uh, makes Shakespeare's work uh, so compelling, you know? I mean, Hamlet uh, wasn't a good guy. He wasn't a bad guy. Uh, he was a human being. So the next uh, circle of hell is a garish party uh, thrown by Finley at his mansion. A uh, loud, aggressive uh, Dixieland jazz, drinking, dancing. We see a beautiful uh, woman talking to a dressed-up Eddie. And then Sarah, like some stray gazelle, uh, wandering into a pride of lions, uh, limps down the stairs, uh, nearly catatonic with drink. So Bert, uh, seeing an opportunity to draw fresh blood, uh, casually works his way over and whispers obscenities in her ear, which we don't hear, but which drive her into a state of instant hysteria. Uh, years later, Piper Laurie, uh, after seeing uh, George C. Scott in a play, uh, went backstage and after uh, congratulating him, uh, she said, George, you must tell me something. People always ask me what on earth uh, you could have possibly said to me in that scene that brought that reaction, and for the life of me, I can't remember. And he laughed, and he said, uh, nothing. I knew I could never come up with something as disturbing uh, as what your imagination could summon, so I just made sounds. But that lack of specificity works on us, too. Uh, not hearing the words, just seeing the reaction, uh, lets our imagination run wild as we summon uh, the worst possible thing, uh, which for each of us uh, may be entirely different. But after the party, it emerges that Finley plays billiards, not pool. Uh, slightly different rules and table dimensions. So Eddie, after convincing Bert that uh, he can handle it, uh, quickly burns through all the money Bert is willing to front, and then his own money, until finally he's reduced uh, to begging on his knees uh, for Bert not to close the bank. At which point, a somewhat uh, sobered up Sarah 
uh, descends to this lower uh, circle of hell and tells Eddie not to beg, uh, saying, doesn't any of this come through to you? These people wear masks, and underneath the masks, they're perverted, twisted, crippled. But Eddie uh, is on a binge and just tells her to get lost, uh, much as he did uh, Charlie earlier in the film. And just to add a kind of uh, malevolent grace note, uh, in contrast to, to Sarah's uh, tearful reaction in that earlier scene, uh, Finley, occupying the same position in the frame that she did, lower left, smirks and giggles at Sarah's uh, humiliation, uh, while Bert uh, sees that he has now won the battle for Eddie's soul and says, uh, go ahead and play him, Eddie. Thousand dollars a game. And as Sarah limps back up the stairs, uh, Eddie doesn't even turn around. So Rawson doesn't show us uh, Eddie's comeback, just the aftermath, uh, as Finley pays Bert off, uh, after which Eddie, who seems contrite, uh, makes the fateful decision uh, to walk uh, back to the hotel, uh, which gives Bert an opportunity to claw at his victim one last time. So after a quick drink, uh, he aggressively pushes open the door to her room and just kind of stands there arrayed in the doorframe, again, like some bird of prey showing off its wingspan before bearing down on a helpless rabbit. Now, as for Sarah's uh, final destruction, it is quietly horrifying. Uh, and for those who haven't seen the film, I'll let you discover that on your own. But at the end of this uh, penultimate segment, uh, she is indeed dead. Uh, the final segment, uh, like the first, uh, takes place entirely in Ames, as Eddie uh, plays his return match with Fats uh, cold sober and with crisp confidence. As in the first match, he talks a lot, uh, but this time he addresses his remarks to Bert, whom uh, he and we now understand to be his true uh, adversary. So after this uh, extended pool montage, expertly edited uh, by Dee Dee Allen, uh, who would later do such great work on Bonnie and Clyde, uh, that death scene where Warren Beatty and uh, Faye Dunaway are riddled with bullets, uh, 50 cuts in about 50 seconds, uh, that was Dee Dee Allen. But finally, uh, Fats says, I can't beat you, you're too good. And after quitting, uh, tells Bert, uh, you got yourself a pool player. But that may be a compromise that Fats uh, had been willing or forced uh, to make, but not Eddie, uh, who takes his money and starts to leave. At which point, uh, Bert erupts, uh, yelling out uh, double uh, fortissimo that uh, Eddie owes him money. And here, uh, unlike uh, the whispered obscenities at the party, uh, Bert's threats are clearly enunciated and uh, quite detailed. Uh, if Eddie doesn't pay, uh, the thumbs will be rebroken, uh, the fingers as well, and uh, the right arm in three or four places uh, for good measure. So after pretending to negotiate a better percentage, uh, to which Bert is amenable, Eddie shows his true uh, new colors and says, uh, we really stuck the knife in her, didn't we, Bert? We really gave it to her good. So Eddie has finally developed character. Uh, not Bert's version, but true character. And he's also apparently acquired uh, some courage because he not only refuses to pay, but announces his intention, uh, if Bert's goons don't finish him off, uh, to come back and kill Bert. And here uh, you see the internal calculations on uh, George C. Scott's wonderfully mobile features as Bert uh, quickly reaches a verdict. Okay, this time uh, Eddie is free not to pay. However, uh, there's a price, always a price, as Bert adds with deceptive casualness, only uh, don't ever walk into a big time pool hall ever again. See, Bert uh, controls not only Ames, uh, but every other uh, major pool hall in the country, which leaves Eddie only two options, really, uh, compromise or resign, and compromise is not an option. But before Eddie leaves for good, uh, there's a terrific moment, a simple heartfelt exchange uh, of appreciation between two artists as uh, Eddie looks Fats in the eye and says, uh, Fat man, you shoot a great game of pool. And uh, Fats, uh, with a rueful smile, uh, lifts his glass and returns uh, the compliment. It's one of the most touching moments you'll ever see. As Fats, presented in the opening act as a kind of uh, arrogant obstacle, uh, is now completely sympathetic. You know, after having been edified by the last two hours and also by the wonderful reaction shots of Gleason that uh, Dee Dee Allen gives you uh, in this last scene, you can only begin to guess at some of the accommodations that uh, he's had to make. So Eddie, uh, having sacrificed uh, his only mode of self-expression, but having retained his soul, walks out into the sunlight uh, toward whatever the future holds for him. 
Uh, the film is superbly directed and photographed. Uh, the German cinematographer, uh, Jürgen Schuftan, won the Oscar for his work here, uh, the black and white Oscar. Between 1939 and 67, uh, they had separate awards uh, for color and black and white. But he and Rawson uh, used every inch of that ultra-wide uh, cinemascope screen uh, very effectively, uh, where the elongated pool table, the low ceilings, the spectators uh, carefully arranged in the frame, it all fits beautifully. As for the acting, uh, Paul Newman, uh, who was nominated uh, for his performance as Eddie Felsen, uh, for the most part delivers the goods in a very demanding role. I mean, he really carries the film and manages emotional shadings miles above uh, anything he'd done to this point. If there's one flaw that pops up uh, now and again in Newman's early work, it's excessive calculation. You see the performance. And there are a few self-conscious moments like that in this film, especially early on. Brando, at his best, uh, as in uh, On the Waterfront, uh, for example, was able to submerge himself so deeply into his characters uh, that every gesture, every facial tick, uh, seemed uh, not only true, but unrehearsed, uh, somehow surprising. Uh, that may be an unfair comparison. Uh, they were very different actors, very different men, uh, certainly. But even though Newman uh, may not have had Brando's explosive natural talent, uh, I think of Paul Newman as a kind of lunch pail actor, you know? Year after year, uh, film after film, uh, just working at it. Uh, while Brando, with a couple of exceptions, honestly, kind of threw away his talent uh, in his middle and later years, uh, frequently uh, giving uh, half-hearted or just ludicrous performances. But Newman just kept chipping away, and he delivered a flawless performance a few years after The Hustler uh, in Cool Hand Luke, uh, for which he should have won Best Actor. He also probably should have won for The Verdict. Uh, but The Hustler was by far uh, the best screenplay that Newman had had to work with to that point, and uh, certainly represents a huge uh, step forward uh, for him as an actor. Uh, George C. Scott, and the middle initial, by the way, uh, when he was asked uh, late in life uh, why he had added the C to his professional name, he said, quote, It took up space. I tell people that nobody knows who Edward Robinson is, but everyone knows uh, who Edward G. Robinson is. And everyone now knows uh, who George C. Scott is, an actor of not only volcanic force, uh, but great intelligence and a wonderful uh, sense of irony uh, to counterbalance that force. The Hustler was only his second uh, major film role. His first was two years earlier uh, as a prosecuting attorney in Anatomy of a Murder, where he squares off with Jimmy Stewart. In both films, uh, his character uh, really comes to the fore in the second half. And also in both films, uh, every frame of his performance is like a shot of adrenaline, uh, not only for the viewer, but he also uh, seems to make the actors around him better as well. Uh, Scott remained primarily a stage actor throughout his career, and he'd made his initial mark on stage in 1957 with a legendary portrayal of Richard III uh, with the off-Broadway uh, New York Shakespeare Festival. But it's interesting with stage actors and film. You know, when I was in college, I saw uh, James Earl Jones on Broadway in Fences uh, by August Wilson, and he was dynamic, huge charisma, uh, filled the room. Although I should say, about 10 years ago, I saw Denzel Washington play the same role on Broadway, and he may have surpassed even Jones. But when you see James Earl Jones in films, and this may be a minority view, uh, he doesn't seem to me to make the necessary adjustment, uh, just a little too big uh, for the medium. Now, George C. Scott uh, was big as well, but he was uh, able to modulate, and his film performances are incredibly effective. And when it came to playing ruthless, demonically driven men, as here uh, or in Patton, uh, he was truly uh, a world's champion. Uh, like Newman and Piper Laurie and Gleason, uh, Scott was nominated uh, for an Oscar for this uh, role and probably would have won if he hadn't rejected or tried to reject the nomination, which no one did that in 1962, especially a guy with just two uh, films under his belt. But this uh, attempted rejection by Scott uh, derived uh, from his earlier experience with Anatomy of a Murder, for which he happily 
accepted the supporting actor nomination. And everyone uh, from his competitors uh, to Hedda Hopper, the powerful Hollywood columnist, everyone thought uh, he was a shoe in uh, But he ended up uh, getting trampled under the uh, chariot wheels of Ben-Hur which won a record 11 Oscars that year, including a supporting actor for Hugh Griffith, a competent but uh, unremarkable performance. And Scott uh, talked about that experience around the time of The Hustler. He said, quote, I was disappointed not to win. And then, after thinking it over, I was disappointed over being disappointed. And I determined never to be placed in that position again. I believe that actors should not be forced to out-advertise and out-stab each other. So he rejected his nomination uh, for The Hustler uh, via telegram. And the Academy responded by saying in so many words, uh, you know, if you don't want to show up, fine, but nominations once issued uh, cannot be declined. And once again, he lost uh, to an inferior performance, uh, George Chakiris in West Side Story. But what a talent. I mean, he had the gift of fury, you know, which along with his uh, alcoholism, certainly wreaked havoc in his personal life, uh, but left us with some indelible performances, of which this is definitely one. Piper Laurie is an interesting uh, case. Uh, She was a Hollywood veteran by 61, having appeared in films well before uh, Paul Newman or uh, George C. Scott. Uh, As a child, uh, she'd been pathologically shy and uh, would frequently just shut down. In her autobiography, which I just read, it's called uh, Learning to Live Out Loud, She says uh, she didn't laugh out loud until she was 18 years old. Before that, she would just silently shake when something uh, struck her funny. So her mother enrolled her in elocution lessons uh, when she was about uh, 12 or 13, which led to acting class, which incredibly enough led to a contract in 1949 uh, with Universal Studios, which, although lucrative, uh, quickly soured. Uh, First of all, uh, Universal at that time uh, was just churning out cheap, low-quality B or even C uh, genre pictures. I saw one of her uh, Universal films, the 1954 uh, disaster film atrocity called Dangerous Mission with uh, Victor Mature and Vincent Price. No actor or actress uh, could do anything with those lines, not to mention the bargain basement uh, production values. And in addition to the name that the studio gave her, Piper Laurie, uh, which she hated because Piper Laurie didn't even sound to her like a name, but I guess uh, they considered her real name, Rosetta Jacobs, uh, too Jewish or something. And the studio also saddled her with this ludicrous kind of uh, too precious for this world image. The studio told uh, gossip columnists that their new ingenue bathed in milk and ate flower petals Uh, to protect her luminous skin. I'm not even kidding. Uh, They actually arranged for her to consume, in the presence of a reporter, uh, some sort of flower or plant life uh, that had been prepared for her. And she said, quote, I don't know what it was, but I ate most of it. It was certainly more interesting than the roles they were giving me. But when reporters were not in the room and she was eating actual food in the cafeteria, the studio heads were constantly hassling her about her weight. They would stop by, check out what she was eating, and say uh, loudly, uh, watch it there, Piper. Do you really need that? You know, which led to a 15-year dependence on diet pills, uh, also known as amphetamines. And that addiction is a primary reason uh, why her career didn't prosper in the wake of her uh, nomination for The Hustler. In fact, uh, her portrayal of Sarah Packard uh, was her last film performance until 1976, uh, when she played uh, Sissy Spacex, a maniacal uh, butcher knife wielding mother in Carrie. So after extricating herself from that contract, uh, she moved to New York uh, to reinvent herself. And her breakout uh, was a live TV production of Days of Wine and Roses uh, on CBS TV, uh, with Cliff Robertson as her uh, kind of partner in booze. Uh, The later film from 1962 uh, with Jack Lemmon and uh, uh, Lee Remick is much better. uh, Great, in fact. But even so, uh, you can see Piper Laurie's gifts start to emerge in this uh, TV role. The intelligence, uh, the vulnerability, uh, excellent use of her full vocal range with startling uh, resonance in the lower register, uh, which she would use to great effect in Carrie. But one of the things I love about her performance in The Hustler The moments when she listens, her complete absorption uh, when her scene partner is speaking. It's a tool that actors uh, will often neglect. Uh, Spencer Tracy was an absolute master 
at that, uh, to be present and attentive rather than uh, simply wait for the other actor to stop speaking. Uh, As with Newman's performance, a couple of stagey moments, but pretty much the highest compliment I can pay Piper Laurie, and Rawson too, uh, for creating the role, is that it hurts uh, when you see her character destroyed like that, you know? Uh, Despite the character's weakness, which the actress and the screenwriter uh, have bravely allowed us to see, or perhaps because of that weakness, that humanity, uh, there really is a sense of personal loss uh, when she uh, goes down. Uh, so a very brave, a very sensitive performance uh, by Piper Laurie. Or let's use her preferred name, uh, Rosetta Jacobs. So the only major member of this cast uh, still alive at 89 uh, years of age. So God bless her. Uh, Jackie Gleason, who appears only in the first and final segments, moves through this film with incredible grace uh, for such a large man. At other times, uh, his stillness uh, speaks volumes. That early scene uh, where Newman is mocking him, uh, the way Gleason contains his anger, the tension in that bull neck, you know, the glare, tremendously economical performance. And Gleason, uh, as a teenager in Brooklyn, uh, had actually hustled Poole himself. And at one point, uh, he and Newman had an impromptu uh, three-game series uh, in front of most of the cast and crew, just for a few bucks a game. And Newman, who'd had a table installed in his home and had been practicing night and day, uh, won all three games. Barely, but he won. After which uh, Gleason, visibly annoyed, uh, took him aside and said, "Uh, Listen, Paul, after all my bragging about my uh, skills with the cue, this is really embarrassing. I mean, give me one more crack at this thing. Just one game, a hundred bucks, and after you beat me again, I'll leave you alone, I promise. And it crossed Newman's mind briefly that, you know, maybe uh, he was being hustled. Uh, But knowing how proud uh, Gleason was, always projecting that image of mastery, uh, he thought, no, it's inconceivable that this man uh, would allow himself to be humiliated like that in front of all these people. Uh, So Newman, with typical uh, generosity, uh, graciously accepted and proceeded to get wiped off the table, (laughs) just utterly destroyed by a beaming Jackie Gleason. Although Newman did get some revenge later by paying off the hundred bucks in pennies Uh, dumped on the floor of Gleason's house. Uh, But the damage was done. Uh, The hustler got hustled. But a masterful work uh, by Jackie Gleason uh, in really his best film performance. Also very effective is the jazz uh, soundtrack by Kenyon Hopkins. It's not a traditional orchestra with jazz inflections, as in, uh, say, Streetcar Named Desire, but a jazz ensemble with drum kit uh, to which Hopkins added uh, traditional orchestral instruments here and there for color. Uh, There's the main uh, up-tempo, alto sax-driven theme, but he often has the ensemble back off, exposing a solo instrument uh, to convey vulnerability. Uh, For example, during Newman's remorseful speech at the end, uh, there's a quiet oboe solo on the soundtrack uh, that adds a nice, uh, unobtrusive, uh, mournful touch. So whatever its minor imperfections here and there, uh, a few moments uh, where the dialogue is a little too literary uh, or the acting a bit stiff, uh, these to me are insignificant uh, blemishes. And in fact, uh, they are few and far between. Uh, The Hustler, in my opinion, uh, is first-class cinema created by adults for adults uh, with something very real and very important to say. Uh, You know, I once saw an interview with Steven Spielberg where he defined drama Uh, simply as people with problems. And The Hustler uh, is certainly that. Uh, But real people, uh, not Hollywood archetypes. And real problems, not uh, fabricated constructs. Stick around for some exciting news about this podcast, a brand new feature, right after this. Your feedback is important to us. On Twitter, at Realtime1960s. On our Facebook page, Or you can email the program, realtime1960s at gmail.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and help us continue to bring you great content, please go to patreon.com slash realtime1960s and subscribe. As I've said from the beginning, uh, the goal of this podcast uh, is to document and reflect on the 60s. And in thinking about ways to better fulfill the first part of that uh, mission statement, uh, the documentation, 
I've come up with something that I think you're really going to enjoy. An ongoing series of evening news reports of 60 years ago. Uh, timely audio clips of uh, President Kennedy and other uh, newsmakers of the day. Actual commercials and public service announcements uh, from that era. So please mark your calendar for October 11th. That's when I'll release the first a real-time 1960s evening report, and the 29th and 30th of this month as well, and uh, even more in November as we continue to travel in real time through the 1960s. Don't forget to visit us at realtime1960s.com for our timeline, each and every podcast, links to social media, how to reach us directly, everything you need to know about this portal into the past that we are creating. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care, and I'll see you soon.